me start you off with some big questions. There is a global liberal order that has been led by the United States and uh, into which countries such as Brazil have been taking in increasingly prominent roles. Uh, do you see that liberal order as one that Brazil wants to join, or do you see uh, some other kind of order as one that uh, a rising power like Brazil wants to try to create? I think the way we see it is that we're already part of this uh, order uh, as a very uh, active participant, not only in terms of uh, our economic uh, relevance, you know, seventh largest GDP in the world, and a country with uh, diplomatic relations with every other uh, United Nations member. And we are a country that I believe is um, very intent upon preserving uh, the positive aspects of this order. So we're very committed to multilateralism, whether it's within the United Nations or the World Trade Organization. Uh, but we are also co a country that sometimes points to gaps or injustices or areas of governance that need to be uh, made more compatible with a geopolitical distribution of economic and uh, political influence that has been undergoing very significant uh, change over the past few years. So in this respect, this is why we defend, for example, the reform of the Security Council or um, more inclusive uh, discussions when it comes to the international financial institutions in Washington, quota uh, system reform in those institutions as well. But basically, within a general um, outlook or perspective of promoting an evolution of the existing order rather than replacing it but in an entirely different one. So what does the newly evolved order uh, look like? How does it differ from the one that we have now? Well, if you take terms like unipolarity, bipolarity, you know, we lived through uh, the Cold War for many decades uh, with the U.S. and the Soviet Union constituting the two poles around which international order or organized itself. There was a unipolar moment uh, during which the United States seemed to be capable of determining outcomes. And I think we're very clearly heading towards a multipolar uh, configuration of power, uh, a multipolar or, um, configuration where the poles are not equal necessarily. The U.S. still wields uh, formidable military and economic power. China is kind of... Um, uh, getting there to the uh, top rank in terms of the economy, but maybe not militarily. There are other established powers uh, with very significant assets uh, in Europe. Uh, you can look at Germany or uh, the UK, France. Uh, the Russian Federation is an established power, even though sometimes it is uh, grouped along with the BRICS as an emerging power. And then you have countries such as Brazil, India, perhaps South Africa, and a few others that for the first time in their history, they're actually participating in the shaping of a new order. So two questions. One is what practical difference would this kind of distribution of power and influence uh, end up uh, achieving? And second, wouldn't things just become incredibly unwieldy the more you shift uh, and devolve p power to broader structures, the G20 and even further perhaps? Uh, is it impossible to get anything done? Well, the point is that this is already happening, and it's not something that you can choose uh, to uh, ignore uh, or to pretend that things are otherwise. And you just mentioned the G20 is a very good example. I mean, until the uh, 2008 financial crisis, it was understood that the G7, or at the time you had the G8 as well, could more or less coordinate satisfactorily uh, around uh, international financial challenges. But uh, come 2008, uh, the consensus was, listen, we need to bring in other important players. Uh, the Brazilian economy was already larger than the Russian economy at that point. Uh, China was outside the old uh, G7 and it was the second economy in the world. So uh, this evolution can already uh, be seen or is already being translated into new governance mechanisms such as the G20. But another aspect that I would highlight, and it's part of what uh, our presidents were talking about today, uh, are global challenges that didn't exist in prior reconfigurations of world order. And one very important item is climate change. So uh, we are almost forced uh, to cooperate. And why through more multipolar and uh, inclusive mechanisms? Because um, in these realms, uh, and I think I, you can say in practically every sphere of uh, international affairs, no country single-handedly can determine outcomes or can establish rules that will be obeyed by everyone. You mentioned the end of unipolarity. 
Do you think the United States is in decline? I think the United States has tremendous um, uh, strengths, uh, and it also has a capacity to uh, re, uh, let's say, reconfigure itself to, uh, to adapt to new circumstances. Uh, and if you listen to um, U.S. diplomats today or to President Obama, uh, I, can, I can sense the awareness that uh, uh, the, the U.S. is developing, that it needs to work with other partners in order to achieve goals that it considers essential for its foreign policy. So uh, in a sense, this does involve a um, mental shift uh, from, let's say, world hegemon to one where the U.S. will have to be partnering with different countries. Um, but this need not be translated into, let's say, living standards, uh, lower living standards. On the contrary, I think the U.S. population can be more fulfilled, um, more interconnected with the rest of the world, and happier uh, in this new role that it can play and will play, I believe. How about China? How do you see China's emerging global role? There's no question uh, of uh, the um, capacity that China has demonstrated for economic growth, for technological uh, innovation, for providing uh, better standards of living for a huge population, uh, 1 billion, 200 million, um, a daunting task. Um, I believe China is also adapting to its new international role. Um, it is uh, increasingly interested in developing cooperative relationships with countries with which it has not historically been too involved. Brazil is a case in point. Uh, for Brazil, China is our number one trading partner, which is something unusual because it's a very far removed, in fact, the furthest country from Brazil. So it's a, it's a new situation for China. It's a new situation for the world. Um, as far as I can interpret uh, the Chinese agenda, I think it is one for um, cooperation with the rest of the international community. Of course, one where, where its interests will be protected and where we will, be, we will need to be more aware of what those interests are. Uh, but again, I think there are issues such as climate change that will force nations to cooperate. Another one actually is combating terrorism because it's, um, it is uh, a challenge that affects every uh, corner of the world. For a few years under Lula, Brazil seemed to be uh, trying to play uh, a much bigger global role uh, and it seems to have uh, been almost burned a little bit in that attempt. Uh, is it fair to say that there's a period of reconsideration or drawing lessons uh, from its recent uh, efforts? Well, that's not how I would describe it. I think uh, what Lula did, uh, uh, these were very important years for Brazilian diplomacy because he provided us with tools that we didn't have. Uh, for example, 40 new embassies were opened. Uh, many of them in Africa, many other consulates and offices around the world. Diplomatic relations were established with every single country in the world. Um, new uh, integration mechanisms were created. The South American Community of Nations, for example, which is a, an integration effort that uh, is relatively new. Uh, new coalitions were created, such as the IBSA uh, Forum, which brings together the three multi-ethnic democracies of the South, Brazil, South Africa, and India. The BRICS countries started meeting at uh, ministerial and, and summit level. So you know, this was like a period of uh, revolutionary almost activity uh, in terms of the uh, expansion of our network of relationships uh, and provided us with uh, new instruments for diplomacy. I think what is happening now is a period of consolidation. Uh, and we're taking advantage of uh, this new network, of these new relationships to achieve some specific goals. For example, it was under President Dilma that we elected the Director General of the World Trade Organization. I see, uh, for Brazilian diplomats, a, a period uh, of um, great opportunity uh, where a um, message uh, in favor of enhanced international cooperation for the benefit of the greatest number of people can be uh, taken seriously uh, by a growing number of partners. With the negotiations over the Iranian nuclear program back in the news, uh, it brings to mind uh, Brazil's perhaps most prominent foray into recent international diplomacy, the deal with Turkey and Iran uh, to try to resolve some of the uh, Iranian nuclear issues. Uh, how does that look in retrospect, do you think? Well, you know, the way I see that is that uh, it was a very important diplomatic exercise for Brazil 
and perhaps also a sign of uh, changing times. You know, both Brazil and Turkey at the time were uh, elected members of the Security Council. Um, they were witnessing paralysis uh, around the Iranian nuclear file, threats by Israel of taking unilateral military action, which uh, to us seemed like uh, a very uh, much um, problematic or something that we would consider uh, ill-advised. So um, we tried to approach Iran, and on the basis of correspondence from President Obama to uh, President Lula and to Prime Minister at the time, Erdogan, who set out some parameters, which he uh, would consider uh, that if those um, kind of uh, ideas or parameters were met, uh, a uh, significant confidence-building measure would have been uh, accomplished. Uh, we set out, and lo and behold, we succeeded in obtaining precisely what had been uh, the agenda. Now, the fact that the Security Council uh, did not respond in the affirmative to that attempt, uh, of course, generated a lot of disappointment in Brazil and in Turkey. But I describe that as a good failure. You know, even though at the time it didn't carry the day, additional sanctions were imposed, uh, in many ways it can be considered a precursor to what is happening now. Um, except that now Iran has more centrifuges, it has accumulated more uh, low enriched uranium, so to some extent it's a bigger challenge. But it was a demonstration that through diplomacy, through dialogue, sometimes you can actually uh, reach an agreement where an agreement seemed impossible even months before. Brazil sees itself as an idealistic and moral great power. Uh, are you concerned about the descent into uh, chaos and oppression of Venezuela next door? Well. Um, I think it's important to listen to the region's opinion about uh, different topics. You know, there, there are mechanisms uh, and regional integration fora uh, where Venezuela is present uh, that uh, have been working with the Venezuelan government to uh, contribute to uh, lessen the tensions that do exist. I think when you see a situation of a country where there's great polarization between government and opposition, the last thing... Um, neighboring countries should do is to act in ways that will exacerbate polarization. So I think in that sense, we have been successful in working with uh, Colombia, with the other countries in uh, UNASUR, with the other countries in, in Mercosur, uh, in acting behind the scenes and, and contributing to the extent possible. Uh, now, uh, I think when it's fair to recognize that the polarization of Venezuela has to do with the fact that the opposition in the past has demonstrated that it is not necessarily democratic because they tried to stage a coup against then President Hugo Chavez in 2002. And this poisoned very much uh, the political uh, environment uh, and it has a certain effect to this very day. Um, I think that with the successive elections in Venezuela that have been considered free and fair with um, international observers and um, uh, strong partnerships with the countries in the region, uh, we can help to steer Venezuela to, let's say, a, a smooth landing um, in trying to overcome this period of uh, acute polarization. But let's face it, countries go through phases like that. Uh, countries go through civil wars. Ambassador Patriota, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gideon.